This was a very revealing walk full of curious finds. It was round the basement, or as it's known, the dunny or dungeon under the Greenock Town Hall. There were six visitors allowed into the Town Hall dunny this day. The five you see are John Macquarie, Francis Dunlop, Grace Finney, and June Campbell with Alex Hardy. The sixth was John Smith, who is taking the shot and making the movie. All of us are from Cottage Identity Group in Greenock, and we're so happy for this opportunity. We were met by Brian, our guide, from the Inverclyde Council, and were led down steep stairs into the clean and well cared for underground storage areas under the town hall. One passage walkway was the thought to be the remains of the long-disappeared Buchanan Close. Brian talked a little about the storage that was available and how the material was being kept there for the Maclean Museum. What we saw were two main storage corridors, jam-packed with a very varied bunch of items. There was good lighting, so we could see him clearly. He then let us know that we should look around under the strict proviso not to disturb the items. Everything appeared to be stored safely, but tightly packed together. Various objects were stored in front of other things of interest, so it was difficult at times to make out what was what, yet nothing was damaged in any way. Here we see a very old green bicycle with different sized wheels, almost lost behind many other bits and pieces. It has no pneumatic tyres and is so similar to the famous bone shaker style bicycles. An old model sailing ship covered in what was everywhere. Dust. It is a three-masted galleon in the Spanish style of the 17th century. The dust being everywhere resulted in dusty birds. As examples, we have a duck, then a large raven-like bird. There are much more to come. We came across a collection of ancient eastern Mediterranean coins, or so it seemed. We were told, however, that these were copies of the real thing. That did not stop us looking, as they are still fascinating. They have such amazing detail. They have been laid out by where they came from. Both sides of the coins are displayed and given places and dates. Heads are shown and many different objects on the other sides. As we moved around, there were unknowns. We didn't quite figure out. Near the coins was a pair of very large keys with nothing to lock. Is this a dentist's chair or a barber's chair? Apparently it could have been used for both with the back being adjustable. Here is a strong and finely made, if dusty, spinning wheel. It is a foot treadle driven wheel. Again, as part of the mix, there is a remnant of our shipbuilding past. This is a plated ship model of a large Clyde built ship. Here, a skilled plater or loftsman draws out the plates required for the ship onto the template. There are quite a few of these models in the McLean Museum. This is a large mock up of a ship construction and engine positioning in a powerful ship. We know it is the motor vessel Turikina. It was a refrigerated cargo vessel built and engined in Sunderland for New Zealand. I am surprised it is stored here. What is its connection to Greenock? There are two hoarding signs and storage. The first is in an advert for Brown Shipyard out at the Garvel House by the James Watt Harbour. This five-berth yard was known locally as the Siberia Yard and prone to dangerous icy deck working conditions. The second advert was for Stevens gum and mucilage. Mucilage is a thick gluey substance produced by nearly all plants. Mucilage mixed with water was also used as a glue. World War II was not to be left out from the items kept. First we have a NAFI show program. The Navy, Army and Air Force Institutes, the NAFI, was a company created by the British government to run 
social places needed by the British armed forces and to sell goods to servicemen and their families. Secondly, we have a warden blowing his whistle at you and giving you advice what to do with your car in an air raid. The third is a perfect ration book of 1953 and 54 for a Miss or Mrs. Christina Lavalierton who lived at 13 Nelson Street. I wonder what happened to her. Then there is a lovely photo of a mother and a little girl. The mother is pushing a pram and only when you look closely do you see that she is pushing her gas mask and a little girl's gas mask on the pram. Finally, there is a Daily Express newspaper seller. The corridors were stacked five high with stuffed birds. There is dust everywhere and thick. We were warned not to touch any stuffed animal as they are preserved with skin affecting chemicals. Birds mounted on perches were a Greenock Museum speciality. Anyone who knew anything of collections of birds, or so it was said, could not help admiring the superior way in which the Greenock Museum birds were mounted. There are many seabirds of all descriptions. There were land animals too. Are these several stoats looking to find their possible prey? Even more exotic animals were preserved such as open-mouthed crocodiles, large marsupials and even a turtle. Here we find Alex with a 12-metre model yacht from the turn of the 20th century. The 12-metre class boats are best known as the boat design used in the America's Cup. One competition was on the Clyde between the Sovereign and Scepter. The Sybil has its sails and hatch and retains its bright colouring. Note that the steering gear is of the old brain gear design. A second model in the Dunny collection is the Royal Sovereign. It is a truly historic model yacht, or what is left of it. It is claimed to have been built in 1798. It was owned by a gentleman called W. Leesk, who lived in Greenock and raced it in the Cowdenhouse Dam in the first few years of the club, round about 1879. The yacht has had a colourful history. There are stories that Mr. Leesk when he lived in Canada, sailed the yacht across the Hudson Bay. Model yachting was very strong in Greenock. The Greenock Club is thought of as the earliest in Scotland, being founded about 1879. Provost Campbell in 1881, Provost Wilson in 1883, and Provost Shankland in 1885 all gave silver cups. Another story about the Royal Sovereign Yacht is more recent. The Greenock Model Yacht Club took care of the Royal Sovereign through the years. It was a yacht far bigger than our modern yachts, so the Royal Sovereign would not compete directly. Hugh Shields, the commandant of the Greenock Model Yacht Club, and others did find a, a use for this large famous yacht. He, they mounted on the yacht a tiny cannon, and on each opening day of the year they would sail the Royal Sovereign off and start the year with a bang by remotely firing the cannon. This all went well except one year Hugh set the yacht up and when the time came to fire the cannon, the wind changed and Hugh shot through the mainsail. There is also a Royal Sovereign mystery I knew about and while I was close to the yacht in the dunny, I did a little investigation. I had this one chance to look at this famous yacht so I checked it out. It was said the Sovereign was shortened at one stage in its career. By taking photos inside the hull, I was able to find out that the prow was built by planks on frame. The stern was built by a different technique, similar to the bread and butter style, or even carved out of a single piece of wood. So one half was totally rebuilt, rather than the yacht being simply shortened. My guess is that the stern is the older half. A bonus find whilst I was looking inside the yacht, the dismantled brain steering gear was still stored in the hull. There were many obsolete tools kept that we had relied on once and thought the height of modernity. 
A full-size dictation tool is here. In the late 1870s, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph, a machine that could record and reproduce sound. The sounds were recorded on hollow cylinders. Each cylinder could record sound for up to two minutes, changing the world of recorded sound forever. A further dictaphone in pieces, showing dusty cylinders almost ready for use. There is an old QWERTY typewriter with ribbons. The keyboard layout has been kept on modern laptops, but the ribbons were supplanted by IBM Selectrix with its typewriter ball and many fonts, and then by word processor and computers. Now we talk to an artificial intelligence, and it changes our talking, accent and all, into text. Here is a solid-built cash register. Its keys are in the old money system of pounds, shillings and pence. On a shelf there is a sophisticated adding machine and a telephone exchange. The exchange was manually operated and set up for individual offices. Away from this set of tools were four sculptured heads of previously prominent men now resting on the floor. I only recognise one who is Sir Walter Scott. More of him later. We were very busy taking photographs, so much so that Francis and myself had to change batteries at some point. Here is a dusty colourful Sir Walter Scott, who once stood proud over a shop front on Waverley Buildings in Westburn Street in Greenock. His paintwork seems little tarnished. He just needs a clean-up. We came across some Guruk pieces. Here are two provost lamps with the coats of arms of Guruk. We discovered another Guruk treasure under a cover showing the town coat of arms of Guruk. The right side shows a version of the arms of Darach of Guruk. The left side incorporates the main features of the arms of Stuart of Castlemilk. The motto is Avant for Stuart and Be Watchful for Darach. Again we came across more technology of the past. There was an old Singer sewing machine which was in a, a lot of homes at one time. My father used to use it for making the sails of his model yachts. A shortwave receiver and instructions. Was that from the war or the Coast Guards? This is a large, high-powered projector known as an epidioscope. This is an optical projector capable of projecting images of both opaque objects by mirrors and transparent objects using glass slides through its two lenses. Manufactured by Ross of London, this old-style projector is also known as a magic lantern projector and the forerunner to the overhead projector. It is very heavy, is made of iron and comes with two original robust wooden handles to move it. It projects using special gas-filled lamps that we have some of. A curious tool is an addressograph for printing envelopes, etc. The following advert gives an idea for, of its purpose. They were used during the war and after to print dog tags for soldiers. There are some fragile things that have survived. Here we have 78 records and a home gramophone. Any flat disc record made between about 1898 and the late 1950s and playing at a speed around 78 revolutions per minute is called a 78 by collectors. Generally 78s are made of a brittle material which uses a shellac resin. When a record broke, you could put it in the bin or, as I did as a boy, use it for fuel in the open coal fire. They burned with a blue or green flame. All was peaceful as long as your brother did not find out. We did come across more things that were unexplained as to why they were here. There is a chief inspector's portable telephone from St. Enoch's railway station. Could this be a first use of a mobile phone? A second puzzle was a gift to the Gamble Institute in Guruk. There is no indication of what it is used for. At last our tour was over and we knew the items were to stay here in the dunny. Could Greenock show these items to the public? I know of two museums that tried to show their day-to-day -day items in public. 
They have very similar things to the Greenock collection. One is the display of old technology in the Smith Museum in Stirling. Then there is the display of stuffed animals in the Dick Institute in Kilmarnock. We came out of the Dunny well satisfied with our exploration. We studied an old door in passing in Buchanan Close. There was an original proclamation for voters asking them to behave properly when they voted. We then walked past items from the Fire Station Museum and said thanks and farewell to Brian, our guide. After a short excursion up historical drummer's clothes, we had some appropriate refreshments in the equally historical Old Provident Bank. Again, I would like to take time to remember John Macquarie, who is no longer with us. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed our little trip.